Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As always on Sundays, if you do not have a Bible, there should be a few Bibles in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we just started a couple weeks ago walking through 1 Corinthians together on Wednesday nights, and we don't have a real close agenda on how many verses we get through. It really depends on how much you guys talk and how many questions are asked and uh, things like that. And so over the last few weeks, we start off, and of course, this is Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And from what we understand, there were at least three letters, but again, only two of them are inspired by the Holy Spirit and for Scripture. And so this is known, of course, as 1 Corinthians. And this church at Corinth, as we talked about before, if you're familiar with it at all, not necessarily a church that you would say, they is just full of saints. They are just such good people. And that's what's so glorious, is it's a reminder to us that our sainthood is not dependent on our works, but on the righteousness of Christ. And so in the beginning of this letter, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, Paul writes to them, those who've been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, and I love this, together with those who are in every place, who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He then moves on like Paul commonly does, and he gives thanks, uh, thanksgiving to God for the church. And then he quickly jumps into an issue that's going on in the church. And uh, what was the issue that he is talking about with them that he's writing about? Right. Divisions about being proud of, or arguing who baptized who. Right, right. So there's divisions in the church that seems to be stemming out of pride ultimately. And it's, well, I was baptized by this person. Well, I went through this person in Sunday school class. Well, I, this pastor does this with me. Well, this elder does that. And so there's divisions going on in the church of Corinth. And the Apostle Paul says, in essence, which is going to feed the whole discussion even tonight, is the way that they're thinking is worldly. They're thinking worldly when it comes to this idea of who's more important and things like that. In the kingdom of Christ, there should be no divisions over this. Christ is the head and everyone else is just part of the body. So there should not be these divisions. There should not be this pride. And so what he goes to, and he, and he goes straight to Christ and him crucified. That's what he's going to go. He's going to listen, here's what I'm going to, here's how I'm going to get you guys back on track. And so this is a great check for all of us. When we are, when we're just kind of off the rails a bit in our lives and we're struggling, the, the thing you've got to do is go back to Christ and him crucified. And he says, I knew nothing among you but Christ and crucified. But we obviously know, again, by the size of this letter and all the things he talks about, he definitely talks about more things with them than just Christ and him crucified. But everything that Paul teaches, everything that he's about is rooted in the gospel, which is Christ and him crucified. And so that's what he means when he says he goes back to that. And so last Wednesday, we end up going chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And he said that when he came to them, he, he didn't come with this lofty speech or with great wisdom. He knew nothing again but Christ and crucified. And he says in verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so again, we, we had a lot of discussion uh, last week on how many times when we are presenting the gospel, how many times as churches we're setting up our services and trying to reach, how many times are we using the, the wisdom of men to try to draw people? How many times are we trying to just make it so flowery or just so great instead of just the power of the gospel and let the word of God do the work? And we want to be a people that certainly believe in the power of the gospel. Paul says in Romans 1, that dynamite of God um, that just explodes in our hearts that the Spirit uses. And so we got through verse 5, and I think we had to stop in verse 6. Didn't we? We had to go all chapter. No! Yes, we did. <laughs> well, then you guys did a real good job. We did. <laughs> Well, good. Well, then what else <laughs> did you all see in chapter 2 after that? We read through it. I don't think we talked through it all. We talked about how the spiritual is folly for the lost. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't make any sense. We're going to look silly. We're going to look foolish. Yeah. Without eyes to see. Right. Truth. 
Right. Yeah. Good. The world. We should. One of the things we said is that we shouldn't be surprised when the world acts like the world. Yeah. When the lost act. When they act lost. They are not capable of understanding the things of the spirit. They are not able to. So why would we say, they, I just don't get why they don't understand this. We should understand why they don't understand this. Good, what else? What were some other things that we touched on? Does anyone remember? He gets into that middle section in those middle verses. They're talking a lot about how the spirit, what the spirit's role is in helping us understand these things, right? I was, I never thought of this before, but I was reading that, that one verse that says, uh, in my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, mm-hmm. but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. And it kind of dawned on me, Paul didn't have Romans and Ephesians. Mm-hmm. Right. He didn't have the Bible. We have. He made it. He made one. It came from the Spirit. Right. And that's probably his Right. Yeah, so what he would have, yeah, he would have been, it would have been coming from the Spirit then, then, and it would have been pulling everything, it would have been pulling from the Old Testament. Because that's what he would have. Maybe some of the Gospels could have been going around by that time. Some of, um, you know, the, the Gospels, probably some of the early works there, but there wouldn't have been all the other things that unpack that he writes and Peter writes later. All that amazing stuff in the Right. Right. Yeah. And what was recorded for us. Yeah. And verse 8, he says, none of the rulers of this age understood this. What didn't they understand? The secret and hidden wisdom of God. What's the secret and hidden wisdom of God? What does he mean when he says that? When he says, um, we, impart, we impart this wisdom to you and to others, and it's secret and it's hidden. What is the secret and hidden wisdom of God? He doesn't understand it. The rulers of this age, they didn't get it. It's the mystery of the gospel is ultimately what it is. It's the mystery of Christ. And they didn't understand it because then he says, if they would have, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. I love that phrasing, that that name for Christ, the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have done that if they understood it. And then he goes into verse 9, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love them. Love him. Where does that come from? Study Bibles will help us out on this. Where does that come from? What does it have? Isaiah 64 4. Isaiah 64 4. So let's I know we didn't go back there last week. So let's go back to Isaiah 64 and check that out. Isaiah 64, 4. He's quoting that in this passage. If he's quoting it, there's a reason he's quoting it. You want to go back and look in context to see why is he quoting that? 63, in particular, speaks about the Lord's day that's coming. And in one sense, like the Lord's day of vengeance that's coming. Okay, that's what chapter 63 is about. And it just flows straight into chapter 64 to where many of you in your Bibles, you might not even have a heading in there. It might just go straight into, because even though there are chapters, those didn't exist before, remember? So they break it up sometimes, but it flows straight in there. Now it was 64. Somebody start reading for us, though. 64 beginning in verse 1, even though it's part of what's going on in 63, this, this vengeance, this day of the Lord. Somebody start reading and just let's just go through 64 and figure out why in the world would Paul be quoting this? That's what we're trying to figure out. Why is he quoting 64? So somebody go ahead. Nice and loud. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake in your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked in your presence. From of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you, who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? Stop there. He's quoting back to this psalm. It's speaking about, or this, this part of Isaiah. And it's the Lord's vengeance on the day of the Lord. And certainly against those who have turned against him. And they're, they're pleading really for mercy from God. His people are crying out. And saying, Lord, are you going to do these things to these nations that are hurting us? 
and that have been killing us. What about when you come down? There were times of old, God, when you came and, and the mountains quaked when you came. The nations, they were fearful and, and, and now your people are just being taken away. It looks like, remember, there's a thing that would go on when the nations would overtake Israel. They thought they had won and they thought their gods could beat Israel's God. And so this idea that they're stronger or their gods are stronger than the God of the Bible. And so they're saying, God, when... Are, are you going to do this again? What's going to happen here? And that's when he quotes this. You did awesome things we did not look for. In verse 3, you came down the mountains quick to your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. And then he talks about themselves, right? You were angry and we sinned against you, God. It's been a long time. How shall or shall we be saved? Then he goes on to say, we both, we, we'll be saved. And you know, we all have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like polluted garment. You know what that means? Yeah, stinky, filthy rags. None of our deeds are good. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind takes us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us. You, you have made us melt in the hands of our iniquities. Oh, man. If it ended there, that would be very good. Why are you quoting this, uh, Paul, just to tell us that we're, we're done? There's no chance for us? No, the mystery that he's referring to, the hidden wisdom, is about to be revealed more. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. Watch this. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not our iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praised you, has been burned by fire. And all the pleasant places have become ruins. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly? Is there any hope in the wisdom, the hidden secret wisdom of God is that there is hope in Christ? So that's what he's building on. So you have to have what's going on in Israel when he quotes that and applies it to even his people now. And what's interesting is that Israel was in their sin and God still saved them as they would repent or some would. Not many, but a remnant. And he's talking to a church that's in a lot of sin. This church is in great sin and great division. And he's calling them back saying, God will judge you for those things, but... In the graciousness of God, there is also Christ in their verse. Okay, so flip back over now, back to 1 Corinthians, so we have that to work from. Verse 10 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows the person's thoughts except the Spirit that that person which is in him. So no one can comprehend the things of God except the Spirit of God that we might understand the things freely given to us. We, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And then it gets into that part of that, the 14. The natural person cannot understand the things of God. Cannot, cannot, cannot. It must take God to do a work. So when you're thinking of somebody, your kids, your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law, your son, your daughter, whoever it is, you're thinking, oh, Lord, I just wish they would get it. You need to be praying that they would have spiritual eyes to see. Because if not, they cannot see. It is not possible for them. That has to come from the Spirit. And, and the Spirit that they receive is the Spirit that knows God. It's the Spirit like, like He knows the depth of God, our God. Right. Isn't that interesting? It is. It's just so exciting that, um, that that same spirit that God gives us is the spirit that knows the depth of, right. of God. 
And that's the spirit living inside of you, and he's the one that will reveal to you the things of God. And then as Tom brought up last week, which we skipped over because it was a hard thing to understand, but I guess we have to cover it now. The spiritual person, verse 15, judges all things but himself to be judged by no one. And then, for who has understood the mind of the Lord as to, so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> what do we do with those verses? What do, you guys, what do you guys make of 15 and 16? We understand he's been drawn, the natural person, spirit of God. You need the spirit. The spirit helps discern everything. What does it mean the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one? What does that mean? Right? In one sense, we're to be the spiritual person judges all things, but then that same spiritual person himself is judged by no one. Yeah. Judge all things, not judge all people. Okay. You know, we're, we've got the word. We know okay. what's right what's wrong. Okay. So in us, we have the spirit to know what's right and wrong. What's and right? nobody can judge us. We are righteous in Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he's our judge. He's our judge. Can't be held to judge. Okay. Other thoughts? I mean, the other thought is we can't judge one another because we have a law in our eyes. Well, that's <laughs> part of it too, right? But then also, when and literally three chapters from now, he's actually going to say, "Judge, you do actually judge inside the church." When he's talking about the church discipline situation, because like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> what are you talking about there? Yeah. He tells us to judge all things. Right. And as Rachel was saying, we are to hold all. Good. In our lives, good. Within the body, without without the body, mm -hmm. whether it's in the workplace or in right. the home or in the church, right. we're to judge all things according good. to God's word good. through the wisdom and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Good. But it's you know it's not. I, I can't sit and look at another believer, an unbeliever, mm -hmm. you know, someone that doesn't. There's no evidence of fruit or right. evidence of salvation. Right. And judge that because I get to be a believer on my own. God, you know, this gracious and kind of yeah. So, so you know, that's God tells us to be careful to judge all things because He has imparted to us the wisdom to do that. Yeah. Okay. Good. I think it. I used this first two Sundays ago. Okay. Good. So then you have the definitely the. Yeah. the Interpretation. So, so what I was preaching on was First Corinthians 13, which is a great love chapter. Also in this book, yes, good. In this letter. Yep. Great letter. Yeah. And you know where he says, hope all things, believe all things. Endures all things, yeah. I, I think he's getting at something like that. So, so when you have friction in the church, and maybe two people are arguing, and you wish they weren't, uh, you have a tendency to judge one another. And I think what he's saying is, don't do that. That's for the Lord to do. Mm -hmm. Hope all things, believe all things, love all things, try to make peace. But don't do what these guys were doing, which is, this guy's great. That it's better. Right. No. Making judgments that way. Yeah. 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 Great. He says, I have a problem with the word judge. Okay. I just, I mean, how can we judge anyone? Mm. I think we should just pray for them. Right. And because you mean you if you, someone says that can go, how can we judge when we have a boulder in our own eye? Mm -hmm. So I mean we just take it to God in prayer. We don't have right. to agree with it. We don't have to like it. Right. We can talk to them. Right. And just pray for them. Right. So what do you do then, brother? When you're reading, you're reading, you're going through First Corinthians. You got your coffee. You're going, and you're like, okay, I'm reading through, and this looks good. And then it does say that you that you judge all things. What do you what do you personally do with that with that passage? What do you do with it? Well, when I start to judge other people, okay, I look at myself. Okay, good. And then I say, okay, what makes me better than them? So okay. I can judge them. I just think God. I say, look, yeah. I don't understand this. I don't like it. 
but it's not for me to fix. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it to you and have it. You said you would. Okay. You said you, you know. Okay. No, that's pretty simple, but I'm a pretty simple person. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have something there? So, what about myself, cross fingers? What do you got? Well, I'm jumping from judging all people because, like you said, in a few chapters, we're going to get to that. Right. Right now, I want to know the sentence structure for 16 because it says, you know, a spiritual person judges all things, but it is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? To instruct the person not being judged or him, the Lord? The spiritual person. Spiritual person. Mm, gotcha. Last week you we were like, you yeah. should have an English teacher like Cutler so that you could talk to him. <laughs> so he That's did true. say that, but we knew <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, you're, 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 she's telling the truth. But. Uh, I, I think he might be talking about um, who instructs the Lord uh, or who, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, because I think it. Yeah. It comes from Isaiah. Where does it come from? Exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's quoting. 40, 40, 30. 30. So hold that. Go back to Isaiah 40, 13 real quick. Do you have any Yeah, you got it already? Yeah. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> All right, help us out. Go ahead. So it, it's talking about, I mean, if you look at the settling, What's the context? The, Good. The greatness of God. And so it's talking about the Lord and how high and mighty he is. And so 12 says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Wait, wait, go, go, uh, go start with nine if you would. Why are you going to ask a lot? <laughs> go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and clothed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? That's good. When the prophets speak that way, or when God speaks that way, like in Job, it, what what's the point when he starts to ask those questions of who's done these things? What do you, what's that? Nobody's like him. Nobody's like him. And so when those things begin to come, the reader or the person you're speaking about or to is supposed to go. Ooh, oh oh. And so it might be that Paul is reaching back there and saying there in 16, if you're going to try to judge these other people, do you, are you the one that understands or gives, instructs the Lord? Is that you? Oh, oh, oh Julie, you're the one, Julie. You're the one who instructs the Lord. Well, by all means, go ahead and judge Rachel then. Or do you understand what Rachel's going through? Do you get? Do you know all the details of what's going on there? Do you do you know that? Because if you do, then by all means, please speak. However, so the person's heart off limits goes back to love. You believe all things, hope all things. Like like Rose on goes back there. However, there are things that will, you are to judge, and that would be all things. Meaning, like you brought up in the beginning, there you can judge whether things are true or false by the word of God. Is this thing right or wrong by the word of God? And you can say that confidently. confidently. What you should not do, and you'd be very careful to do, is if somebody you see somebody they're doing something, and then you make a judgment on who they are, meaning do they belong to God or do they not, or whatever. That's when you've gone beyond what is that? We need a concrete example. A concrete okay, we take concrete examples. Not very pleasant thing to do. Um, someone being your home. Has committed adultery twice in the marriage, very blatantly. He was a member of a church in Louisville, Kentucky. The church had to bring him. 
before the church in church discipline. Of course, we tried to reach him. We did everything we could to try to have him turn from that. We wouldn't. And he finally just denounced the faith and said, I don't believe anymore. That's why I'm not going to change. So at that point, the church had to discipline this person and remove him from membership in the church. So that's, that's not an option. You can't have open adultery in your church. You can't have that. Because you are the body of Christ. You're not the body of Satan. You're not right. the body of some schmuck. Okay? Right. You're the body of Christ. He is in you. Now, after having removed that person, I have no right to judge that person. I don't know what's going on in his life, yeah. or his mind, or how God's working with him. I pray for him every day. Every day. I don't, I don't forget to pray for him. And my heart bleeds for him. I don't know what God is going to do with that. I don't know. I just pray he'll, he'll work at very work. It's the difference of when, when you actually walk through, which they do in First Corinthians 5, when you walk through that scenario, when you walk through church discipline, this is what you need to be very careful of. Uh, Mark Dever says this, does this well. When you're doing church discipline, you are not saying somebody's not a Christian. That would be judging and going beyond what we're to do. What you are saying is, based upon the way you're living, we can no longer affirm that you're a follower. I'm not saying you're not a follower. That's between you and the Lord. We just can't any longer affirm that you are because you will not repent. And that's the judgment part of it. It's not their heart. It's the action. Do you see this as sin? The Bible says adultery is sin. Do you see it? Yes. Do you see that we're supposed to repent? Yes. Will you repent? No. That, that, you're not judging their heart. You're, you're asking them. You're, you're trying to. You know, they're, they're saying that. So then the judgment is that goes against God's word. And there were elders in that church. Meeting with him. Right. Meeting with him. But to say he's now lost forever. To say that he's not a Christian or whatever that that's when you have gone beyond the realm of what we can do and should do. And, and they never told him that he couldn't come back to right. the church. Right. They wanted him to come back to the church. Sure. You know, they, yeah. they went to great lengths right. to try to restore yeah. the body. Yeah. Great. Love the person, hate the sin. Yeah. 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 As sinners that we all are, mm -hmm. we judge. Yeah. I mean, a lot. Whether we blatantly do it or you know mean to be mean about it or you know we judge. I mean, we just do. Mm -hmm. You need to see me on a game day, gator game day, <laughs> walking up to the stadium and see these girls dressed in I don't know what. Yeah. And going, oh my Lord in heaven, do they have a mirror? Do they own a mirror? Are they asking to be raped? I mean, it's just. You judge. I judge. Mm -hmm. But then I pray for And I pray for, please forgive me for judging them, you know. Right. It's, it's hard not to, you know, sure. smack you in the face yeah. sometimes. Go. And I think that's even even this church, that's where they naturally were going. That's, yeah. the, that's why the letter exists. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's because, I mean, like you're saying, this is something that we do. But what we believe, what we, our judgment doesn't count. Right. It doesn't matter what I think about anybody. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. It's by the standard of the scriptures that matters. And so that the mind of Christ and having the spirit then is that when we do look at circumstances where all things need to be judged, hopefully our mind is being conformed to whenever you, when somebody does say, is adultery right or wrong? We would say, well, no, scripture says it's wrong. We have the mind of Christ and we can make that, that call on that thing. But when it gets into the individual heart and judgment on the person, that seems to be where the danger has come. Yeah. One more time. Yeah, come on. <laughs> when you broke it down a second ago and you said about judging someone right or wrong based on the Bible, wow, that kind of went yeah. in my mind because, yes, you can. Yeah. I, I never thought of it that way. Right. If, if it's in the Bible that you shall not do this yeah. and you're doing it, yeah. I can say you're wrong. You can't. Now, what you can't say, and this is where the trick comes in, is what you can't say is their motive or their heart in something. No. That's and that's where we go, guys. We do this all the time. Like John was just saying, we do this all the time. Well, I know that he was thinking. Da 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 da. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Do you have the mind of God that you know what people are thinking? 
And that goes back to actually to the love of believing all things, hoping all things, is believing the best about people. Or, or, how, or how about this? I'm going to drop a bomb. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Go ahead. How many men in this room have never, ever, once looked at a woman in lust? Right. Going down the street, on the beach, on TV, wherever. Raise your hand. Yeah. You committed adultery. Yeah. So this person is practicing adultery. That, right. that is quite different. According to script, according to right. verse nine, right. it's different. Right. And you're not different in the context that his sin is more reprehensible than mine. Right. But different in the context that you can't allow that in the church. You can't. Hey, the, the difference is here's the difference. Here's the difference, and you said this. If there's unrepentance. Right. Yeah. I mean, if there's a lack of confessing and genuine repentance, and that's what the elders kept, that was what was missing. That was what was missing, and that's why when they met with us and you know those involved in the situation, right. they said, "There's just no genuine repentance, right. and we don't see that, and therefore we have to move forward with yeah. the church." And so the reason why that should be there is because Christ is in us. Yeah. And if Christ is in us. How can you not repent? Yeah. And the, the root of all this has still been pride in the church. That's really what the church of Corinth had was a bunch of pride. That's even, it's even when you get into the spiritual gifts later. It's all about <laughs> they're using, uh, they're prideful about the gifts. And so, and that's where he's trying to show us that godly wisdom is different than that worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom would try to go and, and get into motives and what people are doing and all these things, and that's not what that's not our world. That's not what we're supposed to do. By the way, in that example I gave you, somebody say one thing mm -hmm. the example is our second thought after looking at a woman in lust should be, "Oh my, oh my, so glad I have Christ." Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Yeah. Well, I mean, real that that should drive us to Christ, sure. and we should say. Thank you that I have you because I am nothing. Right. And just to be fair, it isn't like any ladies in here have never also lusted after a man. So just to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any I don't want any ladies to be like, yeah, you losers. <laughs> just make sure we're all on the same page here. Yeah, yeah, don't be judging. We're all on the same page. That's all God deals with that. Yeah. He gives you three daughters. <laughs> And you don't look at girls the same <laughs> because that's somebody's daughter you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. And every guy's a predator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting is he he kind of sums that up. And then the beginning of chapter the chapter three, what's the word that what's the next word that comes in? But, but <laughs> you've got the mind of Christ, but. and we have the spirit, but uh oh. I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Wait, what did you say, what? So again, remember, again, just get in a moment here. So we're, we're in Corinth. Paul's visited us before. He planted the church. He's gone on. There's another letter. We sent him a letter asking questions. Hey, guys, I've got Paul's letter. I'm going to read it. Let's get together tonight. We'll have some uh, Greek pizza, and then we're going to come in here and eat together. And, and we're going to eat, and then we're going to come read the word. And so we're reading through this letter that he's given us, and then it's like, oh, we're spiritual. We have the mind of Christ. Okay, good. Look at all this. But I, uh, Paul says, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. <laughs> wow. You're people of the flesh. You're as infants in, the, in Christ. And that should be a note there. This is where that judging has to be very careful. People of the flesh and infants of Christ sometimes look very, very similar. You have to be very careful that you see that somebody's just an infant in Christ and you're treating them like they're of the flesh in the sense of not saved. And infants are going to look, in the faith, they're going to look very close at times as like they're lost. Be very careful there. Because sometimes it's just, they haven't grown yet, right? What he said, verse 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. You aren't ready for deeper truths. You just, you needed milk. Now watch this. 
And even now you are not ready. You should have been a little further along than you are by now, and you're still not ready. If you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy, watch this, and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? When you have these type of ways of thinking, you are being very much of the flesh and acting like humans instead of spiritual also. And so when jealousy and strife are around, according to what we're seeing here, that's of the flesh and you're acting like the world. And it should be a quick sign of, oh man, maybe I'm not as mature as I thought I was in the faith. What are some thoughts here you guys have? As he shifts here and Start to talk to them as these, not saying they're not spiritual people, but they're infants. What do you think? I feel like we have to be really careful when we hear or read something like this and know that it's directed toward us. Right. Because we all too often, I feel like, have a tendency um, to get worked up when someone calls us babies in the face. Um, so like which would be pride right. in our heart probably. With, especially when you start to consider salvation as works. Mm -hmm. Then this can start to become really you know, offensive um, to you because then you're like well, I stayed up all night and I studied the Bible and I went to church every Sunday and I stayed. Yeah. And I I did all, I'm doing all these things. Right. And then somebody called you. Okay. Other thoughts here? That Paul would say this to a church? I think as you mature, though, you could be mature in one area. Okay. Be very immature in another. Yeah. And until you're shown, you would be like an infant. Okay. In yeah, that, take that imagery of infant. In, yeah, in, yeah. In an area. Right. So, right. you know, take that with you. It doesn't so, mean totally. Yeah, so one example that stands out to me um, that we talk about in our home uh, there was a there was a Christian artist twenty years ago, um, Lauren Daigle, and she was asked about homosexuality, and I, I don't remember the, all the words exactly, but I remember the conversations or the interviews and things. And from listening to it, it sounded like she said, "Well, I don't, I can't make that judgment going with that language. You know, I can't make that judgment. So people should read the Bible for themselves and just kind of make their own decisions." And she was hammered really hard by quite a few Christians, and. Should she answer differently? That's not, the, that's not the question I'm going with now. What I, what I noticed, though, was she's, she was at a time like maybe 23, it seemed like, maybe 25. Yeah, very young. Maybe even younger than that, I don't remember. But she was young. And it seems that because she sings really, really well, and because she sings these really nice songs that we like, we kind of expect a maturity in the Christian walk from people like that, that doesn't always exist but because something like you're saying something is seems to be mature or blessed or where you know some form of gifting there so then we just apply it all the way across the board and we can do that in our own lives we can do that with other people as well if we're not careful and say and forget that sanctification is a process and until somebody shows you something just like a child on Infant, I mean, take Simeon, you know, take it and go until they're shown how to do that thing, they're not going to know. Not only that, they have to be able to do it too. And able at that point. Just because you show Simeon a book, right? You can't expect him to read it. He might not have the intellectual ability right. to learn how to read it, right. but at some point he will. Yeah. And so, the, in that sanctification process, if the Lord hasn't brought us to a certain plan, you have to be very wise when you're discipling people and, and, and even calling out people and things of that nature, it, when you are trying to help them with sins, you have to realize where are they at and, and what's their understanding and what's going on. And, and if you're kind of setting the bar way over here and they're not even able to at that point yet, if, if there really is this idea of Romans 12 that our minds must be renewed by the washing of the word, that's just, it's not like it's a, you know, overnight, I mean, for me, that's not an overnight thing. I don't know about you guys, but for me, that's a long process. There are things that if you would have asked me 10 years ago, is that sin? I would say, no, that's not sin. Are you kidding me? That's exactly what I was going to say. That was such a good example that you used with our because if we all 
would stand in judgment of her at that time. Right. If we all look, you know, reflect on ourselves and say, is every time we've been asked a question, a spiritual question, did we answer correctly? Right. Or even the way we would have, we right. would have now. Right. Are, now. Are versus, more right. spiritually mature, hopefully. Right. Then, you know, would we have always answered correctly? Right. And why is it fair to hold her to that same right. standard? Just yeah. because she has um, this platform. Right. You know? Yeah. And it doesn't mean that she shouldn't grow in how to answer that. You know, she, she should. And it, but instead but there were judgments made of she's not a christian she doesn't believe about it. it was like whoa whoa easy now when what does scripture say scripture does speak clearly about the topic so that's what we can say but her heart on what she's doing and i gotta be very careful with things like that and again this this idea of apparently you can be now there's there's different you know these are some of the tensions of our sanctification here Right? Jesus is the author, perfecter of our faith. He, he works in us and he moves us along, all those things. And at the same time, Paul's like, you guys should have been further by now. I'm having to talk to you and I can give you milk still when you should be on me. So it's this, this tension of God's working and his timing on things. And there's a side here that you should be further along. And that's the mystery that's in our sanctification. And if you guys understand, you got a better than I do. Yeah. It seems to me that any judgment that we do should be, first of all, in humility yeah. and very prayerful. Right. Um, but it tends to be done mostly in pride. Right. You know, and yeah. so many Christians, have, you know, we talk about a lot in our family, but Christians today, kind of as a whole, I think are some of the ugliest people in our country. Yeah. Mm. And we don't see it here, you know, not every church, but I'll right. tell you what, when, you, when your outlook is so full of pride, they just know. And not just judging within their own church, but judging the non believers who. Why? Which, in, in like two chapters, we have Paul's like, don't do that. Yeah, we should be <laughs> loving them. We should be. Right. Love, 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 yeah. love them. Bring right. them into, you know, like, be yeah. patient with them. Yeah. But all of this, it just seems like Christians in general are just so full of self righteousness and pride, and they're just. The judgment seems to be coming from them, right. not a prayerful humility saying, right. I feel that I need to address yeah. this. Yeah, and that reminds me when Jesus actually does talk about judging. That's where a lot of people go when they talk about judging and go, you know, judge not or you'll be judged with that same measure. And that's usually where people go. So, judge not. Well, okay, what are we saying? That's not even fully what that means. But I will say this that measure that you use. So, all those who quickly with this young girl, that type of judgment to where there's no grace at all in a, in a, in a room for growth, in a room for, hey, she needs to, to learn and, and, and grow. Nothing there. Like, you have to be perfect right now. If that's how you want to judge another Christian, then that, that judge will be used against you. Is that how you want it? No. Yeah. Um, no. Oh, sorry. Heather first and then Liz. <laughs> I pointed back there. Go ahead. Um, Paul, in this little section, he's talking also going off of a pattern of behavior. He's not Fair. he's not seeing one instant that instance this church Good. has done, Fair. you know, and then writing them a letter and jumping all over them. He's seeing their attitude continue. Mm -hmm. He's seeing the judgments and the pride grow and swell and he's he's saying, okay, now it's not now it's going too far, but yeah. this is not just a one time right. thing, you know. I'm not seeing repentance. I'm not seeing change. I've got to call you out on a sin. Right. So I think we miss that a lot too. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to loved ones, it seems. Yeah. Those closest um, to you? Yes. Yeah. Um, where just, the, you know, man, I really didn't do the dishes tonight. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> there's, there's other examples we could have, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. That's right, amen. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably six weeks, to be honest. Okay, go ahead. You know what? Would you like to continue the story? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I could, I could finish it for you. And, I, and, and Paul already said how much he's been praying for them. And 
how many times are we so quick to go ahead and correct? Let me tell you what you've done wrong, and we have not spent the time that like Paul has spent in praying for that, that person, asking God to reveal it to them. You know, show them, Lord, if you want to use me, then use me. But if not, yeah. So we, we're at the end of our time. So I want to ask this as we kind of just close down from our other questions we sometimes bring into these studies. What are some attitudes or actions from our discussion tonight that you need to change based upon what we're talking about tonight? Is there anything that you would share, any of you would share with the group that the Spirit's kind of convicting you of in this moment, that you would say, what are some attitudes or actions that you need to change based upon what we're talking about tonight? Anyone have anything they want to share? Liam, all right. I'm not entirely sure if this counts or not, but it can't stem from something. So, like, you know what we're playing Smackdown with? Um, when we're playing a video game together, <laughs> just so you who don't know the lingo. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and then, like, we finish the game. And then I tell someone who's been playing a character way longer than me, I say, hey, I, maybe you shouldn't have done that, or I think you should have done that. They know that character way better than I do. So, who am I doing for judgment? But you can also, it's, that's more of a count. You can connect that to real life. So, for example, um, Right, let's just say worship, for example. Um, if we're doing worship and then someone goes, and then like a spiritual infant says, hey, I think the lyrics on that thing were wrong. I think you need to correct that because that's, you know, wrong. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be careful and also study where you are at. But like, because Paul, obviously, he's an elder. Right, he's, he's an apostle. He's going to be right, so he's, sure. no, if you're, especially if you're a younger Christian, you have to like examine yourself and ask, what would I am I so young in my faith? Do I not know something? Like am I missing something? Mm -hmm. I guess that. Okay. That's a pretty good one. Thank you for sure. Anyone else have an attitude or action that you feel like you're okay? Be sure. less judgy. Be less judgy. <laughs> yeah. I walked in different shoes, so but it's just kind of natural. still going back to what he said above with that if to understand things that are spiritual it has to come from the spirit so if you are further that I mean there is that side of yes they should be repenting of sin doing things but also that means the spirit has revealed more things to you at that point in your walk and so really you don't get to boast there so re reminder of I don't get to boast because that's the spirit's work and so it should bring a lot more patience with us with other people and then where they're at in this lawyer. You know, Jesus was with the disciples, the apostles, yeah. for three years. Yeah. And they didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they didn't get it. Like, right. They were hearing him speak and everything. Right. But it wasn't until he was killed, right. resurrected, resurrected, resurrected yeah. and the Holy Spirit entered them. So right. they were like, oh, like yeah. the light bulb came on. Right. You know? and, and then Paul, you know, Paul was trained and, and, and you know, taught from early on right. the, the Old Testament and all of its truths and everything. Right. So when he was, you know, struck down by that whatever that happened right. um, on on the road, yeah. um, you know, and, and God gave him the scales and everything, all of a sudden his light bulb came, right. you know. And so so we have to remember those experiences as we're talking to believers. Right. Just because somebody's professing faith in Christ, we shouldn't expect them to be a Paul. Right. And we shouldn't expect them to be disciples for years in. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's God's growing, not our growing. Yeah. You know, not, it's not according to our expectations. It's and, if, and if we keep that, then, and then hopefully we'll be more humble and more patient. And that could be a much better environment for yes. our growth. Are you going to say yeah, something else? Are you double dipping? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Some of us are more thick headed. Uh huh. The other people. Yes. It takes a hammer. Right. Yeah. 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 
I mean, you might pick it up immediately, and I'm just like, what? <laughs> I've seen that face a few times. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but I think that's where the body of Christ comes in. Walking daily yeah. with one another, just right. one of the sisters and being and studying with each other, having relationships, because you may say something, the kind of plants to see, and they don't quite get it, right. but we could just be having a conversation. Or you said it in such a way, and all of a sudden the light bulb went off. Right. But it took us as a collective right. to be able to spirit works in that. Way. Yeah, and going with what you said, and then we'll close here is that that idea of with the body of Christ, assuming the best and all those things in First Corinthians thirteen, not making judgments on the person's heart or motives, but going back to what Greg said, when we are helping one another, using Scripture as that authority and saying, hey, it seems like you were yelling at your wife. <laughs> Let's look at scripture together. What's going on? And still believing the best, trying to help, but still using that, uh, the, 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 the scriptures as that authority, and then believing that they have the mind of Christ and the spirit of God, and that he will use that to convict. We don't want to be anyone's junior Holy Spirit. That is the worst. You don't talk about when you have that person, sometimes it's a spouse, sometimes they're that person and they're just like constantly. It's like, some people are making faces. Don't make any faces around people around you. Okay? I'm just saying, you know what I'm talking about. Let's let God do it in His timing. Because again, do we know the mind of God? Do we give Him counsel? Then no. So slow down. All right. Who wants to close us in prayer tonight? Good discussion. Who wants to